So let's continue with our lectures uh, for repeating and uh, orientation. We have been working on the background of probabilistic modeling uh, yesterday or the day with lectures, uh, with the exercises, maximum likelihood uh, method. Uh, we have been introducing uh, what it is about, a value of information analysis. Um, we know now how we can uh, calculate the structural reliability. We know that we can do it for a component, but also for systems. We know the system reliability characteristics <coughs> and that goes uh, to uh, redundancy versus no redundancy so it's uh, either a serious system where we don't have uh, redundancy and if we have uh, redundancy then it's a parallel system and we can add to uh, this uh, logical system modeling, <coughs> so series versus uh, parallel. You can add a mechanical behavior, and then we are uh, in the uh, Daniels system modeling, which goes for redundant systems and accounts for uh, the virtual or the ductile behavior in case uh, of failure. So we have covered uh, this part in the last two lectures and uh, we are already If you would zoom in, uh, I, I can do later and again. Uh, here we have the exposures. Uh, here is our constituent damage states or component damage states, damage or failure states. Uh, so this is uh, covered with the uh, lecture one of today uh, and how to calculate the uh, probabilities of failure with form and uh, with Monte Carlo simulation, basically. and. Uh, going a step further uh, so that we can uh, also model the consequences of uh, system failure or damage events we have the system modeling down here so that's that's for orientation <coughs> and that's what we have covered in the last two lectures now we look at uh, how we can collect information and how we can model them uh, so that they can be used in our models. And uh, I think now uh, this is also the point of time where um, I think we, uh, now we had uh, good ground and uh, we have been using, uh, but of course, uh, especially uh, ranging. Um, lecture material which was already there and which uh, we already teach. Uh, now um, we are touching aspects which we have not thought, uh, taught. We have been thinking about it, <laughs> but we have not <laughs> taught it. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> so, uh, and this will this will be basically uh, starting now and will continue until, um, for most parts, uh, until tomorrow afternoon or evening <laughs> <laughs> or night. No. <laughs> no, we, we, we have dinners. <laughs> right. Um, okay. So what uh, will we do? We will look at the NDE, NDT uh, measurement performance modeling 
uh, that's basically uh, inspections. So we have an inspection system, and how uh, are you quantifying the performance? We will have a look um, then to damage detection system performance. So here the situation is uh, you don't have an inspection system and you don't have a device like, like this one. Uh, what's that, by the way? It's that microphones? Yeah. That's microphones, yeah. Okay. So now you have a uh, measurement system attached to a structure. So that's something different. How do we model this? And um, we also look at the uncertainties which are associated to measurements. And uh, here I'm providing some in-depth uh, knowledge on the measurement uncertainties. So when we uh, are able to uh, model the uh, probabilistic performance of uh, measurements, uh, inspections, uh, damage detection information, and um, Okay, and uh, also uh, continuous uh, measurements, SHM outcomes, I call it SHM outcomes here. Uh, when we are able to model this, uh, we can update uh, the structural reliability. So this will be uh, the focus of the second part of the lecture. uncertainties uh, do we have uh, when we conduct a measurement? Okay. So that means uh, it's the very basic approach uh, which an inspection is a measurement, the damage uh, detection system um, provides measurement uh, information and also continuous monitoring with the sensor is also a measurement. So what uncertainties are associated to that it is the uh, measurement technology and the process. So that means uh, if you measure at a structure, for instance, the strains with the strain gauge, then uh, your measuring device is uh, measuring a um, voltage difference and it is amplified. So, or, uh, yeah, behind this uh, resistance change, um, and the resistance change of the strain gauge is actually providing information about the physical strain on the structure. So uh, the principle basically was uh, developed by uh, Lord Kelvin in the 18th uh, century, where they just invented something like the, or they, they knew about the voltage and the current, and they wanted to make it measurable by physical quantities they knew, and it was a strain, for instance. So then uh, this prison principle was discovered, and uh, Strain gauges were one of the first uh, sensors uh, which uh, were developed and which were applied. Um, I think the first applications even was in aviation industry. Um, and then uh, it was also employed uh, for structures, for structure measurements. And uh, this is also a uh, very important aspect. Uh, structure health monitoring uh, has its, its roots in uh, structure engineering, but also in aviation. Okay, but let's come back to uh, the measurement technology. So it is the, for strains, strain measurements, strain gauges, it's the, uh, the technology is uh, are these uh, yeah, strain gauges uh, which we apply to a structure and the process is then uh, voltage measurement uh, amplification 
And then, uh, then we can, uh, with the k-factor, we can conclude the strains. But uh, our models are usually uh, using the stresses as the input, so we need to convert it to the stresses. So this is also an important step. And there is, on the way, there is all, uh, if you really do it, uh, there's uh, quite some pitfalls. So you can easily measure with one strain gauge, uh, one dimensional uh, stress state. But there is uh, only under certain conditions, uh, one dimensional stress state or strain state. Uh, there's this Poisson ratio, right, in mechanics. So uh, this is, um, <coughs> this is something to be aware of uh, for designing SHM systems and to interpret uh, the measurements. Okay, measurement technology and process. So uh, then we have somehow uh, uh, stresses and um, and also uh, here we uh, again have a, if you go with this scheme here, we have a desktop model of our, <laughs> our measurement uh, process. And uh, in the real world, uh, there will be model uncertainties uh, also associated to these uh, models. And then, of course, uh, it's human errors. So, uh, again, for the example of the strain gauge, uh, it's the positioning of the strain gauge. So, um, in practice, uh, who has uh, glued strain gauges on the structure? Karl. Super. Do you also? Okay. Okay, so it's a, it's a very tiny piece <coughs> of, um, of sensor and it is to be glued uh, on metal so uh, that it becomes one that is completely bonded or bonded. And uh, as it is so small, uh, you can easily misalign it, and this will have uh, influence on, again, the strains you're measuring uh, and the interpretation of your data. So you make uh, errors here. And then, of course, it's the uh, data analysis and all kinds of influences. Uh, it can be, I once had a case uh, where we installed a uh, monitoring system and then the uh, SHM technicians, they claimed uh, we have uh, temperature compensated it. So uh, there's also an issue about temperature compensation, uh, which can be done in different uh, ways, but they claimed it is temperature compensated. But when I looked at the data, I saw uh, a 24 hours curve like this. Uh, so well, uh, obviously the, there was temperature influence. <coughs> so what, what uh, did happen? Um, so it was temperature compensated uh, until uh, shortly before the sensor and then there was a box and there was a cabling from the box to the sensor and this piece uh, just this, uh, this size and the other cables they were 30 40 60 meters long they were temperature compensated but this small piece not so I had a full dependency on the temperature <coughs> and uh, then um, again strain gauges uh, we should be aware of uh, I, I s uh, so uh, a strain gauge sensor it can be uh, like your uh, thumb nail this size so we're glued on a structure but the structure uh, is really big so uh, the <coughs> The second challenge, uh, or often a challenge, uh, is where is the sensor? Yeah, uh, we went in the structure and we glued it over there. And there's an approximate, somehow sketch, handmade, uh, yeah, it's there. But uh, if you measure uh, such a, uh, so locally, you have all effects, all kind of effects. So forget about beam theory. It does not work. It is very local stress measurements. Uh, if you have a, 
Where are the pens? Jochen? Or John? Where are the pens? One of them. One of them. Ah, okay. <laughs> Thanks. So if you have a normal beam and you... Uh, so that's an high beam. It's standardized. Um, if you do a design, you have your beam theory, mechanical theory, you can easily do it. And then you measure, you have a strain gauge uh, somewhere here, and it measures in a longitudinal direction. And uh, maybe you have a strain gauge also here. And they will deliver uh, different strains and stresses. Why is that? Yes, super. So you need uh, a shell model to reproduce uh, the exact mechanical behavior. So it's the effective width. Uh, so it's basically the stiffness of this uh, of the web, which influences uh, the strains here. Uh, here will be lower strains and stresses uh, compared to here. Also bending, for example. Local bending, yeah. Will cost another value of yeah. this yeah. strength. Okay. okay. <coughs> so and basically, if you install a measurement system, you need to know exactly, very exactly, in uh, with the precision of the of a tenth of a millimeter, where the strain gauge is. Okay, and then uh, there's another challenge uh, with, uh, or at least to my experience, with uh, measurement technicians. What is the precision of the sensor? We don't know, but it's very precise. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and uh, this is what we are going to address. Uh, usually, it's uh, to have an estimate it's rather easy. Uh, to do a full assessment, maybe not, but I have to have an idea. Uh, it's rather easy. Okay, so these are the uncertainties <coughs> and uh, strain gauges in some detail already. Sebastian? Yeah? Can I have uh, <coughs> another uncertainty? Yes, please. For my experience. Uh, what do you think that when you <coughs> put a sensor? In this case, you are talking about a metallic structure and you blew a yeah. strain gauge. But in yeah. first stress of common bridges, for example, you will bend strain gauges on the common bridges. Yeah. Do you think also that by the, <coughs> by the fact that you are trying to measure a specific part of the structure, you know that you need to prepare the surface to go to the sensor. Yeah. So you have this term, the stress along this area. So you are disturbing uh, the real yep. stress profile of the structure. So it's like this is a it's from physics. When you try to measure something, you are perturbing the field of measuring. Yeah. So you are not measuring the even if if it was really perfect. If you have a rebar, yes. and uh, then you prepare a surface, and your rebar is now different. Okay. And the sensor is here. Then you have a different area, right? Yeah. That's Yep. That is another answer. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, no, just, yeah, just for discussion. Sure, yeah, sure. Uh, but it, it goes to, uh, basically, uh, we need, uh, we need uh, excellent SHM engineering. <laughs> this, is, this is what we need, because uh, they can do it, of course, uh, but they need to provide an information on uh, what the thickness is here. And then uh, your uncertainty is gone. You have a model. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean the most important point is uh, SHM engineering. Uh, uh, this is what we are relying on, and we need to have an eye on uh, that uh, that it is done properly. <coughs> And uh, this will give the boundaries uh, for our probabilistic uh, models. 
So, uh, NDE, NDT, non-destructive evaluation or non-destructive testing, uh, performance modeling. So this is quite a field which is well known since a few decades. Uh, again, the <coughs> origins of uh, and still the largest applications are for civil structures for monitoring and inspections uh, but also for aviation structures and there basically the, these, the, uh, these models have been uh, developed in these communities uh, over the last decades and they are uh, especially in aviation they are highly standardized um, Probably they are over standardized so that some people cannot uh, forget the meaning of uh, what is behind. Um, so, the basic ingredients here um, are that um, we have a probability uh, of indication uh, given a damage size. So, that means uh, that if you have such a device and you have such a tube connection, um, yeah, this device has the size of uh, the microphones over there, for instance, and you, uh, you put it. Uh, basically, uh, you can imagine that you are uh, kind of scanning uh, the belt with this device. So that's, um, that's an inspection technology called ACFM, Alternating Current Field Measurement. Uh, it could be something else. It could also heavy current. Uh, so this is how to imagine um, where uh, how how an inspection is done. Who has done an inspection with uh, with a measurement device or any? Super. I've, I have also done it. Jochen, together. Yes, right. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, we, we did ACFM uh, and ACSM measurements. Yes, okay. <coughs> so, and if there was a defect, um, the uh, machine or the system will make beep. So that's an indication. <coughs> so, uh, then there's also a probability of false alarm. Uh, that means uh, there was no uh, defect, but our system makes beep. And we all already see here, um, if you have the probability of indication uh, for no damage or for a damage, then uh, we knew, uh, we know the uh, complementary events. So we know the probability of no indication uh, given a damage and the probability of no indication uh, given no damage. So it's conditional probabilities and uh, the complementary events uh, are also always associated to uh, the events which are, which are here at the beginning. What yeah, are these complementary events? Yeah, yeah. An example for the complementary events. Uh, so that's um, basically um, um, so the pro or the event of no indication uh, that you have no damage. Uh, so that's uh, proper functioning system. So if you make with this system the test and you know um, that there's no damage uh, and you give it to someone who doesn't know whether there's damage or not uh, and he puts the uh, system uh, to that y weight and he gets no indication uh, and this um, test is repeated a few times uh, then you have the probability of no indication uh, given there was no damage. And uh, the other way around, uh, so you, you have a damaged uh, specimen, and then someone comes with the inspection technology and 
but uh, it doesn't make beep. Then, and again, uh, repeat it a few times. Uh, this will give you the probability of no indication uh, given there's a damage. But the uh, clue here is uh, with the complementary events, you just need to do either this or this, and you can just uh, calculate by one minus the probabilities of the other event, uh, the complementary event. So I, I will come back to, uh, thank you for your questions, I will also come back uh, later to this. Uh, this. What I just described is called a round robin test. Okay, and uh, of course, um, we have uh, simple uh, environmental conditions for an inspection here. Uh, but uh, inspections, uh, especially in the offshore oil and gas industry, uh, they need to be done underwater. And then uh, you see that this guy probably cannot see uh, this much. Okay. So this is already the very basic um, NDE and NDT uh, measurement performance modeling. So this is all, all we need. Now we, um, we are finding out how we can uh, calculate this. There's different means. Uh, one mean I just described. Um, Okay, but uh, one step before that is uh, that our damage size uh, is basically unknown. The damage size uh, in a structure, when we model the damage process, will be a random <laughs> variable. So we basically need to know the probability of indication for all possible damage sizes. And uh, that's a probability of indication curve. It looks like this. So for low damage size, you have a low probability of indication of 0.05, for instance, here. Uh, and then for a very <coughs> high damage size, you may reach one. But um, even if the uh, system uh, makes reliably, or meaning with the probability of almost one uh, beep, uh, there can be some operational errors. And the operational errors uh, are here. So that's uh, basically human errors. So, uh, yeah. It should only be for very large damage sizes, it should be one. So, um, where's the probability of force alarm? Here, in this diagram. Where is it? In at you mean at this point? Mm. Yeah. You see there's a piece of curve here. So that's the probability of what's uh, alarm. Okay. But now uh, we are coming to the point where uh, we should think of how this curve can be determined. It can be, uh, this is what we just talked about, uh, determined by round robin tests. Uh, so it's interlaboratory tests, uh, it's even standardized uh, in, uh, in some guidelines or uh, standards. Uh, you need to have uh, 10 laboratories across Europe uh, doing the same test and then um, the, uh, they are after the same uh, result uh, and then uh, there is a statistical uh, modeling and uh, then you have accounted for quite a few uncertainties basically of all the types we, we have been discussing. So uh, when we go back to our uncertainties um, with the round robin test uh, so, it is uh, 10 laboratories, it, uh, it is 10 different inspector teams, or um, can also be uh, different inspector teams, and 
Then there is uh, also uh, research about uh, how good the inspector teams can be and uh, how well they were educated. So uh, there can be added uh, at all um, steps uh, some complexity. So uh, it's 10 in inspector teams uh, or yeah, at uh, different universities uh, having the same uh, measurement device and trying to uh, find for uh, here these uh, damage sizes. Uh, they will get uh, specimens and they take the inspection technology at, uh, and the specimen and they document what they have found. But they don't know, uh, of course, which specimen is uh, damaged uh, in which way. So, and uh, this procedure accounts, covers the uncertainties associated to the measurement uh, technology and, uh, and the measurement process, and also uh, the, the human errors. And then we, uh, we have uh, this curve. <coughs> Um, but there's also other means of establishing this curve, and this is by, by simulations. So we could, uh, we could uh, model the measurement process, or we could also uh, document uh, the signals associated to each uh, damage size. And then uh, we are coming <coughs> to these uh, expressions. And here we uh, see uh, a damage state. So there's uh, one realization of, uh, of A. And that's my signal by my inspection technology. And there is a, there's a distribution of this signal. And here I have a threshold, and this threshold uh, is basically to distinguish the damage from the undamaged state. So I, I need to define a threshold. <coughs> and uh, then I can integrate uh, this signal in the damaged state uh, to find probability of indication. Uh, that is here, uh, the area under this curve. And um, the area under uh, this piece of curve here is uh, the probability of uh, no indication uh, given that there was a switch. Your signal is the strain? Your signal, signal. What is your signal? Is the strain or is the... That's, uh, that's basically any measurement output. It's, uh, yes, but you, I do defend the threshold. Threshold is the limit on the, on the strain or uh, is the limit on the width of the crack? Uh, it's, uh, it's an uh, technology internal uh, Quantity. It's not. Uh, it's not a threshold associated to the structure. It's just the inspection technology. We are not at the structure. So it's just to distinguish. Uh, you have a signal, um, and this signal has a distribution. Uh, so if you do, uh, okay, we have for the uh, for the ACFM inspections. Um, there is uh, there's basically um, a certain shape of a, of a curve, and if you recognize a certain shape of uh, of a curve of uh, the uh, it's the measurement of the magnetic field, and so there's a magnetic field induced, and then uh, it's, it's reflected back, and if there was a crack in between, then it will be different. So there is a signal uh, associated to the state to to a. And uh, and this has a distribution. And now you need to yeah. Okay. And then uh, you uh, 
define the threshold uh, in your uh, associated to your measurement uh, technology, inspection technology? In so, hmm? just to talk my language, <laughs> uh, you, you define it how much feature, something that is related to damage and that you measure. Yeah. So you have already defined uh, as something that's related to damage, uh, which is your signal. Yeah. Yes. So, so you have any a model inside there. It's not just a, a measure, a, a something related to the uh, technology. You have a, a model which no, relates. No, only technology. We are doing only technology. Uh, only measurement technology. It's in in the measurement. Yes, but how can you relate this to damage? The yeah, well, uh, any, so if you are after uh, a damage in the structure, uh, you can take any technology which uh, somehow provides a changing value, um, which is dependent on the damage size. So you it can be any, uh, any technology. Okay. Uh, maybe I will understand it. But, um, yeah, okay, you are after, okay, we are here not uh, in the situation that we, that we are on the structure, but uh, we need to have uh, the, this curve we need to have before we go to the structure. But uh, my doubt is just that you need a model between the damage on the structure and the what you measure. Otherwise, how can yeah, yeah. you relate this, to the uh, damage This will be at the end of this lecture. Okay, so this is maybe I will understand you. <laughs> okay. Sorry, Sebastian, you have yeah. got this signal from your measurement device directly? Yes. The signal comes from the uh, measurement device directly. Okay. And each time it will be different? Uh, for each uh, damage, size it will be different. Yeah. Yeah. So, sorry, I just don't understand. Yeah. To obtain that code, for example, you have a damage, you know the size of the damage, yeah. you use the instrument, uh, and yeah. uh, you make the distribution of the signal coming yeah. back from the instrument. It yeah. can be voltage or everything. Yes. And then, in the instrument, you know that there is a threshold above which there yeah. is detection or not. Yes. And you put the threshold there. Yeah. And it accounts for the probability of overcoming or not the threshold. Yes. Okay. Yes. Exactly. Super. <laughs> <laughs> um, the point here is that uh, in the undamaged state or in the reference state here, you also have a signal distribution. And uh, this is basically where you can calculate from the uh, probability of no indication uh, if there was no damage and the probability of indication uh, if there was no damage. And the, um, so far, uh, and especially in the aviation industry, uh, they are after, uh, after reducing this probability. So this should be very, uh, very small because uh, if they take uh, uh, if they do an inspection and they get a, an, an indication, a beep, only as a damage, and then they uh, start to uh, repair or to replace the component, but there was no damage. And this is really obstructing uh, uh, operation and um, yes, and uh, this can be really costly. So uh, usually these uh, NDE and NDT uh, technologies uh, they are optimized um, for giving a low uh, probability of communication in case there was no damage, because this is really can be really costly. <coughs> but they are wrong. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We, we will know better. Also, uh, information which are imprecise can have value. They are overlooking, they are over standardizing. They are wrong. Okay. Um, you mean there is a lot of uncertainty about that? No, no, it's, uh, it's standardized and they have to. Uh, this has to be uh, lower than 5% uh, with 95% uh, uh, confidence. Yeah. 
Uh, so this is what they are after, and they are designing their technologies just to arrive at, at that um, at that reliability. Uh, that makes in certain uh, circumstances sense, uh, but it's not uh, it's not an overall conclusion because uh, also uh, they so you only a reliability wise uh, optimize the threshold. So the background is threshold optimization, but you should optimize it. Uh, for your decision scenario, for uh, exactly what you are after, and not something in between. Good. <coughs> oh, we made six slides so far. <laughs> okay. Um, what comes next? Okay. Uh, here. Uh, this is the threshold, and this is what uh, what I've been talking about. The threshold uh, influences uh, the probability of uh, of indication curve. Uh, here uh, we have only the indication if there was a damage size, so we don't have anything for zero here. Uh, and here we have a high threshold, and here we have a low threshold, and this is how the uh, probability of indication curve uh, changes. So. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, if you lower the threshold, it will be lifted, and uh, then there's uh, yeah, also a higher inclination uh, of the curve. Then. So the threshold uh, influences the probability of indication. It's an arbitrary measure associated just to the measurement technology. Uh, it's, uh, it's standardized, but that's maybe for some scenarios it's fine, but for others not. And what do we have here? Um, okay, that's uh, that's another concept. Uh, you can basically uh, get out uh, this uh, the entity uh, and measurement performance modeling uh, only out of uh, the probability of indication given a damage and probability of indication given no damage. So this is the four probabilities I uh, had on the first slide. And um, so that's called a receiver operating uh, characteristic. And uh, here, um, uh, one curve uh, is only associated to uh, one damage size. And uh, here we have a low damage size, and if we have a high damage size, then we see uh, that the probability of indication uh, given there was no damage. So this is uh, very important for, for the operation, uh, for the integrity management of uh, airplanes or of structures, so that there is a low uh, probability of indication given that there was no damage. And if you have high damages, it's, uh, it looks almost like a rectangle. Uh, so this is what they like to see. Of course, uh, they don't like to see these lines uh, where there is quite a significant uh, probability of indication of thermal selection. Okay, some examples for... Yeah. But I have the slides anyway, okay. Good, good. Um, so we see here the crack length um, in millimeters. And this is for visual inspection uh, of steel structures in ships. And then you have uh, easy, moderate, and hard an environment. And uh, yeah, this has been assessed by, uh, by uh, with experiments. So for instance, with a probability of 80%, you will be able to recognize a crack size of uh, around a crack length of 150 millimeter. So that's something like this. So if you take, uh, for instance, a um, inspection technology like alternating current field measurement, ACFM, then uh, you have uh, crack depths here ranging from uh, or until 5 millimeter. And 80% uh, you can detect a damage size of 3 millimeters. But uh, it is the crack depth, and here we had the crack length. 
So, uh, how is this, this interrelated for steel? What is the relation between the crack depth and the crack length? Steel looks like it's uh, it has an elliptical shape. Uh, you can reproduce this, this by testing and then uh, cutting through your specimen, and then you can measure. And uh, so this is usually uh, L divided by uh, two or three. So. This means uh, this would be a crack length of around 10 millimeters. So with visual inspection, it's 150 millimeter, 80 percent. And uh, with this technology, you can get down to 10 millimeters. You can find. And uh, again, uh, going uh, talking about the uncertainties uh, associated to the measurements. This uh, does not mean uh, that uh, this is bad, and this is, does not mean uh, it is good because it's just more reliable. This is only if you narrow your uh, perspective to reliability. But uh, if you are after the value of information, for instance, this can have a very high value of information uh, because uh, you just need the costs uh, of the human to do the inspection. Here you need the cost of the human to do the inspection, the measurement technology and the data processing. And then of course uh, it's the issue, are there small cracks? Uh, do we expect small cracks or do we expect large cracks? Where, where do we get that information from? Any idea? Do we find it by monitoring? No, that's something strange, right? We want to measure, but we need to know before. Uh, we measure what the crack sizes are. How do we get it? How do we? How can we calculate crack sizes? Experience. <laughs> yeah, experience. Uh, some people, uh, very experienced people, they can tell. With a photography, if you, if you can take a photography of. Yeah, but you do a measurement. Yeah. Okay. We don't want to do a measurement. We want to know before. Can yes. You do a numerical model. Yes. Very, very detailed one. Yeah, right. For example, lances or something. Uh, crack size. Uh, what uh, mechanism is that? Fitting. Yes. Okay. You have a load history. Too. Pardon? If you have a load history, yep. you model. Yeah. Yep. You do a uh, fatigue damage modeling. You uh, do an uh, SN approach, but then you don't get the crack sizes. So you need a fracture mechanics model. Then you, uh, you can do crack size distribution for each. Uh, year in the service life. We need that information. And uh, this is also an important point here. Uh, you need to remember, uh, but I have it also in the, ah, here it is. Uh, it, it, this was an icon, uh, or the icon project, uh, late 90s, uh, where in the offshore oil and gas industry, all the uh, available technologies uh, were evaluated uh, with round robin tests. So this is the information source for getting uh, probability of detection curves, probability of indication curves.
There will be more clever people than me to answer uh, how this looks in concrete. <laughs> Is there someone uh, who know how the cracks, right. how the cracks are looking in concrete? Are so we, we have uh, we have a steel crack, um, and we have uh, the there's a ratio between the depth and the length. You mean the crack in concrete? Yes. There are always cracks in concrete. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's this uh, yeah. stage one and stage two, and uh, only you have cracked concrete. Yeah. So uh, cracking yeah, crack the concrete is not a problem. But for some applications, we consider uh, cracking steel reinforcement. Yeah. And then it's very similar. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Okay. So. Now we uh, we could calculate a probability uh, <coughs> of indication curve. We uh, we assume that the signal uh, is distributed with the mean and the standard deviation. It's normal distributed, and the mean and the standard deviation they are dependent on the crack size, and the crack size ranges from uh, uh, zero to ten millimeter. And we also have a noise distribution. So basically, we have defined uh, these distributions here for the damage state independency of uh, of A, and then we also have the reference state. But there, there is a relationship between the size of the damage and the signal. Yes. Yes. So this is your model. This is the uh, yes. What is this? This is the model of uh, this, this signal. This, this is, is the what model we did. between the, the signal and the, the damage. Yes. Yeah. Need the yes. Need the yes. <laughs> ah. Uh, This is not a commercial. <laughs> Just want to show you some code. Um, so this is our task one. It's too small, yes. <laughs> we need a new projector. <laughs> Again. <laughs> I think it doesn't help. Doesn't help? This morning it worked. Yeah, well, the. What should I do? I just need to make it bigger. This is our this is our MATLAB code and it has a lot of grammar errors, right? <laughs> so because I put it in Word. Uh, so um, uh, can someone come up here and explain this MATLAB code? <laughs> Anybody? Maybe we, we can do it together. <laughs> so I need a, a volunteer. 
Okay, uh, if there was no volunteer, I have to choose someone. <laughs> Who's familiar with the Matlab? <laughs> okay, Karl. So, uh, clear all variables, clear the screen. <laughs> uh, this looks to be the number of samples, one million. Yep. Uh, we're defining a vector that goes from zero in increments of 0.5 to 10. So What's zero. Uh, what could that be from our model? You have the slides. Within the size of them. Yes. Good. Yep. Okay. So now we're generating normal random variables with, I believe, a mean of one, uh, standard deviation 0.5, and we're generating one million samples. Yeah. Uh, so one. One. The mean, mean, the mean? No, the, the second one. The, the third uh, one. Uh, uh, is this the vector? This is a size This is a size of the vector. You yeah. can uh, also uh, make two lines of. Ah, okay. uh, so it's a. Uh, it's, uh, it's a matrix, uh, but we. But it's a vector. We make it a vector by having one left. Uh, set threshold 0.5. Yeah, we fix the threshold. And then we're looking for we're. Counting the number of uh, elements of this vector that are greater than this threshold. <coughs> so this is a vector and there's a one every time the element is greater than the threshold, zero every other time. Sum will count up to one, so we have the number of elements that are exceeding the threshold and divide by the number of samples. So the fraction of samples that are exceeding the threshold and then this is the fraction of samples that are less than the threshold. And, uh, well, you recognize from the name, but uh, what probabilities are this? Indication. Yeah. And in which state? Reference. Reference states, no damage. Yeah. Okay. And then for the damage state, uh, we're looping through I, which is going along this vector. So we're going, I guess this was for for i equals 1, we have a sim 0. i equals 2, a sim 0. 0.5. Uh, our signal, so we're now generating another set of random variables where the mean is uh, <coughs> yeah, 0.7 plus, plus 0.1 times the loop. So it's uh, 0.7 plus, I guess, 0.2 for the first loop, so 0.9 for the first loop. Uh, and then the variance or the standard deviation also uh, decreases. So this is, I guess, the function you showed where it's yeah. it's a function of the damage, which is kind of indicated by i. Same number of samples. But uh, what is that? Or no. Let's uh, let's uh, have a few words mm -hmm. to that one. Uh, why do I start here with two? Because you have to jump the for the probability. Because yeah, otherwise, if false. yes, uh, here we are after damage, and uh, in uh, but ASIM starts with uh, zero, so uh, and that that's no damage, yeah, that's why uh, there's a two here. So, and then uh, you look at this line and at the uh, task definition I gave you. And to tell me whether there's a mistake or not. Should it be the, uh, the damage size? Should it be A, C, or I? Very good. Very good. Yeah. Good. Uh, so we will change this. We need to write A, Z. Oh, where am I? Here. Oh, I. Okay. Okay, go ahead. And then uh, 
Now the same as above, we count how many samples are above the threshold. So probability and then divide by the number, so probability indication. And the count the number of samples below the threshold, probability of no indication. And then it's it's indexed by the the I, so it's for a specific size of damage. Uh, and then oh, we're filling in uh, probability of indication. The first entry corresponds to the first entry of this, which is no damage. So we fill in the reference state probability of indication. And then uh, for all the other, looks like, yeah, for all the other uh, states, maybe? Oh, no, this is, um, so we are adding uh, okay. a, another line to, mm. okay. or we're making a matrix uh, so that we, uh, that we have the metrics of the probability of indication uh, where we have the probability of indication in, in one line and in the other line it's damage size mm -hmm. because that's what we are after. Thank you Carl. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>
a crack size of uh, I think 0 0.5 or 1. And for that crack size, uh, this is the probability of indication. But there's. It's just like when, when you are at, at the threshold, the probability of indication is be zero. Because you will out not. I mean, if you are below the threshold, it will, it will not indicate anything. Should not indicate. So anything. now we. Uh, but I don't know well, if. I what you are getting is uh, for each uh, measurement. So if you have a defined crack size and you put your measurement uh, technology on it, then uh, you get a distribution of. You don't get uh, just one signal, it will vary. Or you may, uh, you may say, uh, okay, uh, uh, the measurement technology is very good and I will put it on and uh, then there will be just one signal, uh, which doesn't have a distribution. But if you go in other environments and other operators, then they will have, uh, they will uh, now a slightly different signal and that's how you get your distribution. But, no, but and I, mm -hmm. I was just, uh, you said before, you, you put your uh, instrument and then if there is a damage it says being, but it could be yeah. that it's wrong or not, okay? If you put yep. the threshold at 1.5, means I, what I understand is that you say uh, your instrument, if the value is below 1.5, don't say being. Should be that. Doesn't detect anything if it's below the threshold. Should should work like yeah. that. So when it's below 1.5, you don't get well. You always get zero. But, but you should. But then there is the probability of false alarm. So the minimum there, if I understood, should be corresponding to the threshold and should be zero. We need to distinguish the threshold uh, and the damage size. Uh, there may be a way of recalculating the, uh, the threshold, and I understand that uh, it has been uh, often done um, to define uh, the a threshold for crack size. Or so, or if you think of a section loss, and uh, then you can derive uh, a threshold and. Um, it could be, uh, this threshold could be derived like this. Um, but uh, this is a different uh, situation. Uh, here we are not uh, defining the threshold with the damage size. We are simply, uh, we just want to know how the uh, inspection system performs in dependency of the damage size. This is what we are after. We are not uh, after uh, what could be a critical damage size. There, But there will be a way of uh, associating the threshold to damage size, clearly. Um, you can work it out maybe after the... After maybe the we can work it yeah. 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 Okay. Um, so I will send you an update of uh, this task Okay, now let's start uh, with the main part of the lecture. Can we have a break? Yeah, let's have a coffee break. So we uh, we have been 
finishing uh, with this one. And now we, uh, I will make the next try to increase the number uh, of the slides uh, per time unit, basically. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but of course, uh, if there are questions uh, to something uh, which we have been going to, please. Yes, I, I would, uh, one question is that this uh, noise distribution that you just uh, wrote is just like an error you introduced to the model, the noise that you wrote there. The noise? Yeah. So that's the signal basically in the undamaged state. The signal in the undamaged Yeah. Okay, so that's something that's I go. This one. Okay, so you can So we have one model that depends on the damage size of the signal, and then there's another model for the reference state. That provides also the signal, but for just for one state, the undamaged state. So it's different from the error of the environment for natural noise. Yeah. White noise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So in the in this reference state, uh, undamaged, uh, there should be uh, all the environmental influences should be covered, uh, so that you have the uh, proper signal distribution in the undamaged state. Actually, I also wanted to come back to this slide. Thank you. Um, <coughs> so when we uh, think about probabilistic modeling. And uh, we see here that uh, this is obviously a probability density function. Um, how can I calculate, uh, for instance, uh, this uh, probability of indication? Uh, just by taking basis in the uh, distribution functions. Okay. Yes, OK, we, we, we can integrate. But uh, what would that uh, mean uh, if you just work with distribution functions? So it's just 5% uh, you said, I think we should consider. The yes, uh, OK, if we can work with uh, 95 what? You said 95% is on the other side, and 5% is the other side. Yes, so and that goes to which distribution? Uh, oh, okay. There's a probability density function, but do we get the 95 out there? We could get by OK, by integration. But if you integrate the probability density, that's what I'm after. What do we get? Conversion. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So uh, of course, uh, if you have the distributions, we can uh, we can work with some of the Carlos simulation uh, for integration, um, or uh, simply with the uh, commutative distribution functions. This is what we need a few minutes later. So, uh, and uh, I've made a few adjustments here. Uh, so this is 20, and there I inserted a E0. Please do also in your uh, task. Okay, there's a few literature with, uh, sources. We already talked about this. Uh, there is the probability of indication curves uh, to be found. Uh, you don't have to do any integration there. They are just uh, given, uh, associated to, uh, to different uh, inspection technologies. And then uh, yeah, there are some statistical best practices of how to determine the detection curves out of the European project. Um, and there's a lot of material and guidelines uh, to be found, but we just most important is uh, to uh, have this basic uh, modeling I've, uh, I've introduced. This is quite generic. So, okay, uh, now we, we are not uh, now in a situation where we uh, just have a very small uh, area which we are uh, observing with our inspection technology, but we have. Um, put sensors uh, to this structure and uh, we are obtaining uh, responses from this bridge and these 
these uh, responses. They can be analyzed in uh, various forms. There are various methods over the last decades which uh, were developed. You can do an uh, experimental model analysis, for instance, or you can use uh, output only uh, analysis schemes. You can look at the yeah, you can do a model analysis uh, and also look at the higher frequencies, what, what they are doing and are they dependent uh, on the damage damage development. Uh, this is what uh, VCE is doing, right? right? So, um, what, uh, what should we do now? We don't have uh, we don't have our component and our inspection technology, but we have the bridge, and we have a model analysis. And the model analysis uh, that means the complete structure uh, is or the behavior of the complete structure is analyzed. Uh, I think this was also the intention for the development of these uh, damage, uh, damage detection technologies that you, uh, with, uh, with a few sensors or sensor network, uh, you can basically uh, have a parameter which depends on the complete structural system. And you may have a damage indicator. So obviously, um, this information is on system level. And so where's the difference to the previous slides? Find the difference. Yes. Yeah. Now we have a damage indicator here. And here, not a single. Mm -hmm. We may have a damage indicator in the reference state, so the undamaged state, and in the damaged state. This, this was quite easy. But uh, how does what happens to our probability of uh, of indication? slide and well, I remember that I should increase the number of slides per time unit. <coughs> so uh, now we have a probability of indication surface. It could look like this. So if we have a system of two components, that's uh, the simplest system we can uh, think of. It's uh, one component is not a system, but two components is a system. So uh, we have a, a probability of damage curve and we um, surface. And we see here that's, uh, that could be component one and that could be component two. And here are uh, the single uh, probability of indication curves associated to the damage of one component and uh, no damage of the other component. And here, uh, this is the probability of indication curve component two, with no damage of component one. But um, if both components are damaged, then the probability of uh, indication uh, will be higher. 
So that's why we have this surface here and it may look like this. So what we need uh, is to establish the probability of indication and dependency of uh, A1 and A2 associated to the two components. Uh, so that's basically all the points in here. But we need uh, to think a little um, what should be the uh, probability of indication uh, at this location. Well, that's obvious. Uh, both, uh, it's zero. Uh, so that's the uh, probability of force alarm if uh, both uh, components are undamaged. So that's the undamaged system state. But what may not be so obvious is uh, that here along the line, um, we have one component in the reference state, and the other component uh, is damaged. So uh, this is the probability of indication here. And uh, so we also need to define uh, the appropriate, or we need to do the appropriate inti integration um, in these states, uh, basically along the line here. <coughs> and uh, also along the line here. So, um, with a very good uh, basis of the uh, NDE and NDT um, performance modeling, we can uh, do basically also the damage detection system performance modeling. So uh, we just uh, redefine the signal to a damage indicator. And um, we should be aware of that the response is uh, on structural system level. And also the indicator is on structural sy system level. So we have information for the structural system. And um, yeah, one can imagine uh, if we uh, talk about the round robin test for this bridge, this will be a little complicated. And costly. Um, and costly, yeah. But, uh, well, in the IRIS project, uh, VCE organized and coordinated. Uh, there was at least uh, five inspector teams t at one bridge, uh, not this one, but another one, which was deconstructed. So then it was uh, found out uh, that uh, what damage sizes basically and uh, damage scenarios could be identified. So this was uh, cutting of the, um, yeah. of the pre-stress, yeah. of the pre-stress tendons, uh, only a few tendons which could be identified. And then it was a settlement of, of a peer they cut it also through the pier and made a hole and then it was a controlled uh, damaged uh, That's the S101 bridge uh, and I think we, we can access the data set. Yes, we have it on the website, yeah. I guess. Yeah. But anyway, they are available. Yeah, yeah they are available. Um, so we have an idea of how, uh, with this test, we have an idea of how the how precise uh, <coughs> the damage detection can be. We don't have the full curve, but we have an indication. Um, but of course, uh, such systems can be, um, uh, so meaning the uh, probability of indication can be for such system performed uh, by simulation. And that's actually a research topic in uh, yeah, surely an, an area of uh, structures, but also in aviation. So the uh, large uh, aviation companies, uh, Airbus for instance, they are after uh, establishing the probability of indication by simulation. So it can be handled by simulation. Um, but uh, well, surely um, here we have a K-rail system. Um, what kind of structural system could that be? Mm. Uh, uh, yes, and more precisely. What is the question? 
mean yes. just the we have a parallel system. This is I right. Don't know, yeah. And uh, can we say more specifically which uh, type of parallel system could it be? Mm -hmm. Then the system. Okay. Yes. Um, so we would know uh, what happens in the ultimate uh, limit state here with the cables. Brito. Brito. Pardon? Brito. Brito. Uh, I. It, uh, it depends uh, on the material properties. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure whether they are good. It's steel. They can be ductile unless they are uh, very hard or uh, treated in a way that, that they become brittle. Yeah, and actually, yeah, anyway, good. Uh, I need to go on with slides. Good. Um, so we, uh, we have a system and we have many components. So, um, but then, if you have many components and uh, you would like to establish uh, a curve here, and so you need for each component uh, at least 10, but uh, better 100 uh, damage states, but you have a system of many components, and so even simulation uh, gets uh, computationally demanding. Um, so, Another approach could be the direct calculation of the probability of, uh, of indication. Uh, there's a paper, I think it's uh, later, of the EWSHM uh, 2016, where for a specific damage detection algorithm, stochastic subspace damage detection, uh, we know the properties, the statistic or the probabilistic properties of the damage indicator and can directly calculate the probability of indication. So we just uh, we just need a sample here and here, and we can directly calculate it uh, with uh, with an analytical function. Okay. Um, maybe this is yeah. Okay, this is time for something general. How do we describe in a value of information analysis uh, our measurement? What do we need to describe in a value of information analysis our measurement? How is the measurement uh, information characterized? There are three main characteristics. What are they? Could you repeat the question? What are the main characteristics of uh, measurement information for value of information analysis? Accuracy. Is it yes, amount? accuracy is, uh, is one. And it's number of calculations. So accuracy accuracy uh, this could be the precision or the uncertainty, it's all the same. Uh, what else? It's three. Cost? Yes. Very good. And what else? Risk, action. Uh, yeah, they, they are not associated. Yeah. They are in the decision scenario we are after. Yeah, it's the more obvious one. Probability. Pardon? Probability. Utility. Utility. Yeah, utility is mm -hmm. cost. Uh, yeah, it's more obvious. It's the type of the information. Uh, so whether it is damage detection uh, information on system level or whether it refers to a component, so it's the type. And that uh, the type basically tells us uh, where to put it in the probabilistic models. Sorry, uh, type of type of information. You say type of measurement. Uh, measure measure. No, 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 that would be the technology. But uh, the information uh, is uh, how is it or the type refers to the situation where um, how is it related to our structural performance of any given example. It is the inspection information, uh, which refers to the component we have inspected. 
or it could be the uh, damage detection information uh, associated to the complete bridge, to the structure it's on, sy on system level. Uh, so you yes. mean could be about the frequency of the track width, for example. This is you mean by type of information? Yeah, because Maybe what yeah, it, it, it could be, uh, it could also be uh, a strain. Uh, so this goes, um, so if we have a strain measurement, we can input it uh, in our fatigue damage model, because there we have stress ranges. So we still need to come from the strains to the stress ranges. So this is a type. Uh, then again, damage detection uh, information, any damage indicator on system level uh, or on component level. So is it a parameter that you measure or observe on the structure? Yes. Is it yes, but is in, in relation uh, with the characteristics on how to uh, associate it to our probabilistic performance models of the structure. This will come later. Okay. Can I ask you if you could try to be more specific in terms of that word time? What you mean? Because time is quite vague. Yeah, yeah. If you'd like to add a few short sentences after time, is it what? Related with the structure of models? Maybe. Just Maybe the rather. Where did I leave the pen? Over there. Well, as a curious one, because we can't really understand time is quite a It's the relation to the structural performance. Specifically, and uh, the first question that we said. Then then uh, okay, what are the uh, main characteristics of measurement information in the context of a of a decision analysis? Okay. So, if you want to do a decision analysis with measurement information, we would need to know about the accuracy, precision, or uncertainty. We would know about the costs for SHM investment, SHM installation, SHM operation, and SHM uh, maintenance and replacement. And we should know how, what type of information do we have and how does it relate to our structure. So of course we can do uh, also <coughs> a, a probability of indication curve uh, for a two-component system. We can just take basis in the uh, signal volume uh, we have been doing anyway. And then uh, we define uh, for the signal now um, multivariate normal distributions. And this is an example of a multivariate uh, normal distribution, a bivariate uh, normal distribution, that's why there's two. And here we have the mean values, and here we have the covariance matrix. And there, uh, what is the correlation? No correlation. Yeah, yeah. no correlation. Yeah. Why did you assume a normal model? Because this morning, for all materials that were also always uh, different, uh, gamble wide, wide yeah, yeah. only for the permanent flow there was a normal distributed. Yes, it, uh, and yet it depends on the measurement process, uh, what comes out, what signal distribution. 
uh, but normally it's a good approximation and uh, it's good to, to handle uh, these distributions. So let's go to MATLAB. of one component, the other component. Uh, here we have the parameters in the um, in the reference state. And uh, now we are operating here with uh, the CDFs. This was the point I made uh, just, the, uh, just after the restart of the, of the lecture to determine the probabilities. So it's very, very uh, similar to the example we just, we just had. Readable. So now we, uh, this is basically our probability of, uh, yeah, the probability of indication. Here uh, it's a probability of false alarm, that's quite high, that's 0.4. And then we see that the uh, that surface, uh, or that the numbers are increasing here, and they are uh, close to 1. Here in this area where we have significant damage in one component and the other component. And here uh, it's always the same number. So that's uh, due to the. Uh, oh it's, it's, I think it's even slightly increasing. Yeah. This is uh, due to the definition of the state here where one component is damaged and the other not. Yes, uh, I will distribute uh, the programs uh, for these two tasks and uh, you're welcome to play around with that and uh, there we have been discussing about changing some parameters. Please do and play around uh, and see what, what will be happening. Try to understand why it's, uh, it is happening. Okay. Um, so this slide we already know. It uh, contains um, uh, our uncertainties. They are associated to the measurement technology and process. Uh, then, uh, uh, if we describe uh, probabilistically uh, this uh, process and the technology, then there will also be more uncertainties, and we have more human errors. We also know that. Um, when we do round robin tests, uh, we can account basically for for all uh, these type of uh, of uncertainties, and the um, yeah. And then uh, we should also also know that here this field um, this is a domain basically of psychology, and there's different models. Uh, so the performance of the uh, humans will be uh, dependent on how they uh, they are trained and how they feel, basically, <coughs> and uh, how difficult the task uh, is of the inspection. So that is what we have seen in the, for the visual inspection. Uh, so uh, if there is a very hard, uh, accessible environment, uh, then the probability of uh, detection or indication will be lower. 
data analysis are different. I mean, this is a, there is a data analysis in the measurement technology and another one in human errors. Um, yeah, so the data anal analysis, uh, they can, can also be done uh, improperly. Or you mean in that data analysis, analysis may be the, that you consider a limited length of the signal and things like that? Yeah. In the first, in the second is just uh, someone that doesn't know how to analyze yeah. it. Yeah. 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 Now we have a look, closer look uh, to the measurement technology and, and the process, um, how that could be modeled. So, uh, here we have our sensors. And uh, then we usually have some electronic equipment to amplify the signals and to um, yeah, that we have an output device that could be a, a computer or yeah, in previous times it was something else uh, where we just see the signal, for instance. So. Um, And uh, what we can do here is we can describe uh, with the process equation uh, the measurement process. And um, that takes basis uh, in uh, basically a probabilistic models which are valid for, uh, for all types of measurement systems. Uh, so we could say um, it is a measurement uh, system uh, with a strain gauge. Um, and an amplifier of a certain type uh, and uh, then uh, a data analysis procedure. So uh, for that situation uh, we can uh, derive a process equation. Uh, and, uh, but we also have another source of uh, getting to know the precision or the measurement uncertainty and that's uh, observations. So you simply uh, take the measurement system to uh, to the laboratory um, where you can control the conditions and then you measure and see what uh, how the distribution of the signals look like. So this is another uh, information and here uh, this may be uh, more specific so this uh, is valid for all types uh, of measurement systems um, meaning uh, for the specific application you have uh, it's uh, is valid for the type of the sensor, the type of the cabling, the type of the amplifier, and the data analysis. And here uh, it is for the specific sensor, the specific amplifier, the specific environment, uh, you will get uh, the um, distribution of the signal and then you can update. That's uh, Bayesian updating, uh, so this is an example here, the uncertainties are higher. Uh, the observations uh, provide less uncertainties, so a lower standard deviation. And the posterior will simply uh, be that the information is more sharp, uh, so uh, the density here is higher and there's a lower standard deviation. So, I see, sorry, the second one, there's also the operator, the uncertainty to the operator, who may is mm. carrying out measures. Uh, good point. Um, you're only here. Uh, and um, yeah. when when we are here, um, we have very controlled uh, conditions, and uh, there could be some. You're right. There could be some uh, uncertainties due to the uh, how the observations have been uh, taken, but they should be very low because uh, it should be a. Uh, a very controlled environment for that type of information. So, and this can be done uh, for strain gauges uh, in a way that we can formulate the measurement equation as the uh, model uncertainty uh, for the amplifier strain, and this is the apparent strain, and the apparent strain is caused by the temperature effects in the strain gauge. 
So this could be a process equation. And then the, um, so that's the amplifier strain. Um, it can be described like, like <coughs> this. Uh, basically, uh, you may have seen this. Uh, anyone who has done uh, strain gauge measurements should know, uh, should recognize here this uh, UA and UB and the K factor. Uh, and then, uh, okay, that's the four that's uh, going to the circuit. So uh, it can be done uh, like this. There's a few more factors. That's the amplification. Um, um, and we have the gauge factor and the gauge factor variation. So that's the K factor. And the gauge factor variation is this one, I think. And then there is a modern uncertainty of the gauge factor variation. The transverse uh, sensitivity, so that goes to the uh, Poisson ratio, uh, so we are measuring in one direction, uh, but um, the K factor is determined uh, with, the, with a certain type of metal and a certain type of specimen, and then uh, there is a difference between uh, this uh, K factor determination and your real structure. So that's uh, basically the transverse uh, sensitivity and also the specimen Poisson ratio uh, goes in and uh, the Poisson ratio of the gauge calibration um, and there's an amplifier zero deviation, uh, that, that's this one. Yeah. So this is uh, how, um, how process equation for a strain measurement uh, can look like and what uh, are the <coughs> sensing factors. And then there's also a temperature coefficient uh, for the gauge factor. Uh, we have here the process equation for the apparent strain. That's the apparent strain, and that's the process equation. And uh, right, there's many influencing factors, but there's only a few ones which are really relevant. And that is the uh, gauge factor and gauge factor variation for the strain gauge, and the amplifier zero deviation. So that's basically this line, this line. One is uh, the serial deviation is relevant for very low strains. For very high strains, it's the gauge factor and gauge factor variation which is relevant. Okay, and basically uh, the um, uh, interesting thing here is uh, that this uh, model has been built um, with, uh, yeah, the Packaging information on the strain gauge and on the and the specifications of the amplifier, and uh, the knowledge of uh, this one. So here, uh, the production process uh, of strain gauges uh, is described, and there is the meaning uh, of the uh, parameters which are on the on the package, like the K factor deviation. And so you have the probabilistic models in here, and then. Uh, it's uh, also some some uh, books where you can take uh, information out uh, on the measurement process. And um, where does that take basis in? Uh, it doesn't come from civil engineering, but um, it comes from uh, where you really need to know what is your measurement precision. It's something else than civil engineering. Um, so where on earth uh, do we have the largest sensor network? Pardon? Uh, yes, uh, okay. Okay, but let's uh, th think of the earth. Earthquakes. Earthquakes. Uh, yeah, that's a good candidate, but... It's, uh, it's weather measurements. And it's the uh, calibration of the global weather models. And they have been, uh, in the 80s, they, become the, they become aware of this uh, challenge, that they had uh, many measurement information, but they didn't really know the precision. And that's why they started to uh, regulate uh, and to derive models and standardize models uh, on how to 
derive the measurement uncertainty. And that's uh, basically the isoguide 98. That's the uh, uncertainty modeling of the measurement. And it is, uh, it basically distinguishes uh, two types of measurement determination. Uh, one is the process equation and one is the observation. Observations. Uh, so For this example, is. For example, just to understand. Yeah. Uh, so if you have a string gauge, what is the prior probability density? In, on the x axis, you have. On the x, uh, on the x axis, uh, it's the measured strain. What you measure? It's the strain. The value that you measure. Yes, probability density. So this is not related to any structure. I mean, is the the string gauge wherever you put it, it you have this distribution. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So then, okay. And this variation depends on the position of the string gauge. Maybe. Or less. <coughs> the instruments. Just for, or on yeah, the instruments, on the temperature, maybe on the yeah, yeah. temperature variation, mm -hmm. things like that. Mm -hmm. Then what's the difference with the second curve? The likely probability right. density. This is uh, determined uh, based on a process equation. So this is uh, this equation. Or it's, uh, it's this is the measurement equation. And uh, this is the, uh, that's the P here. That's the process equation. So then you uh, basically, if you go with EPM and EPF uh, in here, you have a uh, Distribution of the mechanical strain, and also you need a model for the measurement, uh, for the model uncertainty of this uh, process equation. And then you uh, arrive at this distribution. If you uh, observe these quantities, um, yeah, okay, you cannot observe this, but uh, if you observe this one, then you will get uh, this distribution. 